Deborah? Yes. What was y'all's final spring record? Oh, let's see. It was five and three. Oh, good. Yeah, I think it was it, it was very good. Yeah, great. For you know, for all the problems since we only had freshmen. <laughs> yeah. Well, not only, but it was close, pretty close. Mm -hmm. Hi, Deborah. Hello, how are you? I'm and good. Good, good. Good to see you. Well, Bill's behind me. I don't know if you can see him too, but I'm he's in he says he's incognito. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to tonight's uh uh talk. Is she gonna be coming from is she is she gonna be over in uh Griffin? Is it completely Zoom? She's, where is she, Ellen? She's in Blairsville. Blair, Blairsville. Blairsville. Yeah. Well, some of us have to live in the mountains. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I sent the note out to uh, everybody I knew that had gardens. And I told them it was tonight. I said, you need to register. Get out, cat. Go on. <laughs> Sorry. Close the door. They always say, make sure your pets are not in the room. I forgot that part. <laughs> so. You just reminded me to turn my phones off. Oh, that's true. I don't think I've done that. Well, I'm going to go back to mute, and then I don't have to worry about any of it. Okay. Good evening and welcome to the May edition of Your Backyard Association. Brought to you by the Coweta County Master Gardener Extension Volunteers. I'm Alan Summerlin and co-hosting tonight's program is Deborah Williams. The Backyard Association 
presents a monthly gardening program the second Tuesday of each month, with the exception of December. All programs are free and are presented just for you. Master Gardener programs operate under the leadership and guidance of the University of Georgia through county extension offices throughout Georgia. For issues regarding gardening, water quality, agribusiness, family wellness, and life skills, Coweta County Extension can help. As you can see, the contact information is on this slide. The McGuffey Nature Center, along with its six hiking trails, are located in the Coweta County Fairgrounds complex. Master gardeners spend many, many hours each month planting uh, new plants and removing non-native plants and doing various trail improvements. To help with some of the expense involved, we have a way that you can help by purchasing a brick paver for the honor and memory garden, which is on the paved purple trail. It's a very nice picnic area, very scenic. You could honor a child's achievement or maybe the birth of a grandchild or the memory of a loved one or maybe the memory of a pet. We currently have over 100 bricks in place. The deadline for this year is May the 28th. So if you would like to have a brick paper with an engraving honoring someone, please call the Coweta County Extension Office to make arrangements. Remember, May 28th, is the deadline. Have you ever wanted to see a, a BYA or Master Gardener presentation, but you just couldn't fit it into your schedule or you forgot about it? You don't have to miss a single thing because our Ag and Natural Resources Program Assistant, Karen Mansour, is re recording and uploading them to the Coweta Extension website. Go to the website and scroll down to the Master Gardener Extension Volunteer link and find the links to our programs and events like Alan Summerlin, Dan Gentry, and C.R. Phillips Pruning Wood Workshop and Dan and C.R.'s Lawn Care for Homeowners. And of course, our BYA programs. You can also find information about other upcoming Extension programs, health information, newsletters, and UGA Extension events. On Tuesday, June, 20, June 8th, sorry, June 8th at 7 o'clock, the Backyard Association welcomes Melanie Furr, Director of Education at Georgia Audubon, and also a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. Her talk, A Year in the Life of a Hummingbird, will be very exciting and informative. She will be introducing Sibley, a ruby-throated uh, hummingbird who collided with a window last fall breaking a wing and isn't able to fly. You will learn ways to attract, create a healthy environment, and discover the amazing word, world of hummingbirds. Before I introduce our program tonight, I would like to recognize and thank uh, Melanie Landrum. Melanie is a tri-chair of the uh, Backyard Association and does an outstanding job of getting top gardening speakers from all over the state. Thank you very much, Melanie, for the great job that you do. Tonight, Becky Griffin is a University of Georgia's community and school garden coordinator, where she works with extension agents across the state helping create successful gardens. Becky teaches practices that create sustainable long-term gardens. She's also a pollinator health associate and a Georgia certified beekeeper. She frequently teaches workshops on beneficial entomology and integrated pest management and enjoys participating in pollinator research. One of her favorite, favorite projects, uh, Becky coordinates the Great Georgia Pollinator Census, of which I think is gonna be the big part of her program tonight. Let's all welcome Becky Griffin. 
clap, 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 clap. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Alan. It is a joy to be with you all this evening. Um, as I mentioned, my husband's from Coweta County. He spent uh, his formative years in Moreland and is a proud graduate of Noonan High School. And I've had the pleasure of visiting um, McGuffey Nature Center. So for those of you who are online and haven't been there, you need to put that top on your calendar. So to get started, I'm going to um, stop my video and share my screen. All right, um, can we see that okay? Yes. All right, so um, as um, Alan mentioned, I have a lot of hats with Extension. I'm a school and community uh, garden coordinator. I've done some work down in Brooks Elementary School in Noonan in their pollinator garden out in front of the school. I love working with pollinators. I love insects and um, we'll just get started and talk a little bit about the census today. I did want to share with you our apple blossom is over, but I work at the Georgia Mountain Research and Education Center in Blairsville. We have 1,415 acres of research ranging from apples and blueberries and wine grapes to corn, soybeans and cattle and pollinators. I do some bee research up there as well. Right now we are supposed to be in the middle of the 17 year Brood X Cicada event. I was very excited about it and honestly right now it's kind of a bust. Um, we've had, I have had maybe, I don't know, 20 to 30 on my property here and you can hear them, but you gotta listen for them. And I was told it would be so loud that we wouldn't be able to get things done. So I don't know, stay tuned, maybe, maybe good things are coming with those, but so far not a whole lot going on. But this is a picture of our apple orchard. We are the, um, the largest apple research facility in the southeast and we have researchers from North Carolina as well as Georgia working on our, some of our 1800 apple trees. One of our new projects that I'm very excited to be a small part of is the Heritage Apple Project and that project is where agents and uh, people from NRCS went around to these homesteads, these farmsteads, where there was a backyard apple tree maybe somebody's grandfather planted it or their great grandfather. And they collected cuttings from these trees and did some grafting on some healthy scion, um, some healthy rootstock and came up with about a hundred different varieties. And we planted that apple orchard this early spring and in about three years, we should be getting apples. So stay tuned for that. That is um, one of the most exciting projects that I think we've got going on up there. And I'll tell you a little bit about some bee research. Um, this is my crew. This is some of the guys at work and I get them to do all sorts of things that they didn't do before I came along. Um, those of you who've ever visited Jimrec will know Freya Jones. She is our administrative person and actually she takes care of all of us and she's an artist. So I have some research hives here. We are setting up across from an apple orchard and she painted all of them. And she's so funny. I told her, let's go ahead and make them unique so that the bees can find them because bees uh, do recognize patterns. And she took that to heart. And um, I have six hives in total and she decorated all of them. But we're setting this up. We've done some research on bee gut and bee biome. And that's kind of one of the things we're working on this spring. So I have to show you being a bee person. Um, this is a picture of the queen bee here and I couldn't resist. This is uh, in one of my hives. And she just wanted to say hello uh, to everybody this evening. She's a very good queen, a nice layer. And these are all her worker, her worker bees. And last bee picture, I promised last honey bee, but uh, look at that beautiful bee and that those mandibles there and the pollen on her little face. So how could you not fall in love with insects, especially bees? But that's the end of my um, sharing of bee love and we'll get started on some information y'all may be a little more interested in. So the Great Georgia Pollinator Census. Uh, many of you, I know Coweta County is very supportive of this project and I so appreciate that. But for those of you who don't know, this is a citizen science project that has been around. This will be year number three. And it's a project where Georgians count insects that land on a favorite pollinator plant for 15 minutes. And a favorite plant is one that you see a lot of insect activity. 
And since I'm giving you guys sort of the inside scoop, I will explain how that happened. We did two years of a pilot project to kind of see how the counting was gonna go. We were trying to see how the logistics of this project. And at that time we had 50 people volunteer to be part of the pilot. And I spent a week traveling the state, giving out asters for the project. And I did this in April with instructions on how to care for them in the summer so they could be counted on in the fall. Well, an overwhelming majority didn't make it to counting. They were, uh, they had forgotten that they were there and weren't cared for. Some were stolen out of gardens, some were mowed over. So we had to punt and said, all right, you all pick a plant that you see a lot of insect activity and that will be what we use for counting. And that was just one of those happy accidents that worked out really well. But when you count on your favorite plant and you see insects, you don't have to be an entomologist. We're not looking for species identification. We are just looking for you to put the insects into one of these categories. And the project is a year long project, even though we count in August because we spend the rest of the year educating people on how to tell the difference between the bees in these categories and the flies and the wasps. And we talk to people about, um, I, I zoom into classrooms. We do a lot of work on social media. We did Zoom before Zoom got to be the, the blessing or curse that it is uh, in 2020. We have had um, a lot of workshops. We put together a lot of publications, YouTube videos so that everyone can feel very comfortable counting and putting their insects into one of these categories. The project really has three goals, which is why it is more than just two counting days in August. The first is to create or add to sustainable pollinator habitat. And those of you like Alan who are native Georgians understand that when people move into Georgia, they may try and bring some of their favorite plants that might not do so well with all our heat and humidity. Uh, lilacs come to mind. I meet a lot of people that move down from up north and they want traditional lilacs. Well, uh, it's not going to work. And what we want to do is we don't want to have frustrated gardeners. We want to have great habitat that is useful for pollinators, gets through our summer droughts, handles all our, of our humidity and our crazy up and down spring temperatures to last and be sustainable so that the gardeners are happy and the pollinators are happy. The second goal is to increase the knowledge of insects. How I came up with this project idea is I was visiting gardens across the state and I met amazing gardeners, people who knew a lot about soil health and right plant, right place, but they didn't quite understand how insects fit into all of this. And I would be called to a garden who just swore they had beneficial lady beetles only to find that they had Mexican bean beetles. And those of you who are experienced with those know that they will eat your bean crop to the ground. So I wanted a way where we could teach people to not only um, understand insects in their garden, but learn to love them. So that's my favorite goal. And that's the second one. And the third goal is, of course, to generate data about our pollinator populations. We are the only state that is doing a, such an encompassing pollinator census. And over time, hopefully we'll be able to spot trends. We'll be able to see where in the state certain insects thrive more than others. We'll be able to match climate data with insect populations and all sorts of things, which is why when you count in August and you upload your counts to the website, we ask you a few more questions um, in addition to how many bees did you see? How many flies did you see? So we appreciate your patience in answering those other questions because they really will help all our data scientists use the data to its fullest. And I have to give a shout out here to Megan McCoy. When I first started talking about this project, I said, we need some cool little insect mascots that I can use on all of our social media and our flyers and on hats and t-shirts and stickers. And she developed these sweet little insects for us. So that's why you see them everywhere. You see anything about the pollinator census, you'll see one of these cute little cartoon type mascots for us. All right, so uh, this is the website. It is ggapc.org. 
And I thought I switched this out this morning, but these were last year's dates, so they're not gonna do you a whole lot of good. So when you get your calendars out, to write down the dates for this year, it is Friday, August 20th, and Saturday, August the 21st. We always have a Friday and a Saturday because we have a lot of school groups on Friday, and Saturdays people count, you know, at home with their families, and you can count more than once. But our tagline and our motto is protecting Georgia's pollinators one count at a time. So it is mostly a web-based program because I am one person, and I was told if I wanted to do this project, I had to learn to build a website. So I took a class on building a website, which for an entomologist was quite the stretch. So if you are in the middle of nowhere and you wanna participate and you have access to a computer, you can participate. You don't have to go to in-person events or workshops, even though those, those are a lot more fun, but everything that you need to learn how to count is on the website. And as you may remember, uh, you see our little mascots here again. If you upload your counts on the counting days, you can download one of these certificates. And it's fun for me to travel around the state and see these in schools, in community garden kiosks, on master gardener bulletin boards. But you will notice that this year, um, this past year, Megan slipped in a little blue bee here. This is supposed to be an orchard bee which is one of the main pollinators for the beautiful apple trees that we have up at Jim Rec. So we look, think about our goals and we think about are we, um, are, are we achieving these goals? Because what you guys want to know is how the census is going, what is the impact and the results. So the first goal is, of course, um, we want to talk about are we increasing the knowledge of our of our population. So we've had over 130 schools participate. And what that means is I or a, um, a master gardener or an agent will train the teachers in the summer on how to conduct a count. And we give them, um, if you look on the website, the educators tab, we give them everything they need to know to tie this census into any kind of science, technology, engineering, and math. And as a matter of fact, several schools have used the census as a pathway to STEM certification, which if you are in education, you know that's kind of a big deal. But this is just an example. Uh, in 2020, this school happened to go back in session in time for the census in August, and they got their counts done. So that students count and the teachers verify those counts. So if you have a kindergarten class, and they're out counting, we are excited about that because that means they're getting excited about insects. But we know that the data generated by a kindergarten class is really not um, data that is useful or reliable. So the teacher will not upload that. But that doesn't mean that those kids did not get a really great experience. So we want to encourage everybody to count and the teachers verify and only upload the counts that are useful and uh, were done correctly. So it's a lot of fun. You can see the bulletin board up here. They um, did a really great job. When the kids came to school that day, there were signs as they came into the school saying, are you ready to be part of pollinator history? Um, the kids were excited. Uh, it was a lot of fun. In 2020, you know, we kind of had to punt because some of the schools were not in session at all in August. Some were totally virtual. Some decided to go virtual the week before the census. So we really had to punt and we spent a lot of time helping teachers. But you know, the schools are only one part of it. We also have gardening groups. In 2019, we had 140 events across the state counting pollinators. So those are very important groups to us as well. And we love to support them and give them all the resources they need or y'all need to do the counts. And in 2020, we could not have events like that. So we emphasize staying at home and counting with your family. So we uploaded some videos on how to do that. We had some of our family and consumer science agents actually post recipes for foods that need pollinators like watermelon, salsa, things like that. And I created a Spotify playlist with such hits as Ladybug Picnic, 
so that everyone could have some pump up music before they went out to count. And that was so popular. We're doing that again this year coming up for sure. So the, another goal of course is the creation of habitat. And I'm often asked, what is the number one problem with pollinators? Is it pesticides? Is it climate change? What is the number, if I had to guess one thing, it would be habitat loss. So here on this side, you have a beautiful habitat. Um, this is actually perfect for fireflies as well. We have blooming plants, we have rotting logs, which some bees love to use as nests. We have high trees where butterflies can, can be protected from predators. It's just the perfect insect habitat. And on the other side, you have a strip mall that was created and they couldn't get anybody to take them up on the offer or start any stores. So it sat empty for years. And the only green part is that tiny little pitiful tree and that turf grass with all that heat and asphalt, nothing's gonna grow there. So it is important for us, especially those of us who love and know about gardening, I kind of feel we have a mandate. We have a responsibility to plant for insects because we're gonna make the difference. It's not gonna be um, big corporations. It's not gonna be um, any kind of laws passed. It's not gonna be elimination of pesticides. It's gonna be those of us who have a yard, no matter how big it is, that take on the mantle of responsibility to make really good sustainable habitat for our insects. And as you can tell, I'm very passionate about that. And that is a very important part of the project for me. And I wanted to show you who we're fighting for here. In the spring, uh -oh. you may see areas like this. Let me try again. Well, I will reload that spring, later because I'm not seeing any of the beautiful pictures. So we'll, we'll go back to that when I finish the slides. So I'm, I apologize about that. It's, um, we know that we have bees that are outside of honeybees. We have about 4,000 native bees in North America. Some of them like to live under the ground. Some of them nest in logs. And we need to make sure that we learn about those. Um, a lot of people are shocked when they learn that there are bees other than honeybees. They're shocked to know that what goes in the ground affects a lot of our native ground nesting bees. But when we talk about creating habitat, this is um, one of the great, I think, successes for the, the pollinator census is, as I mentioned, we start in January teaching habitat. What are great plants to have? How do you make them um, happy in their soil, in their requirements? How do you pick the ones that are gonna work well in your little microclimate? We spend a lot of springtime talking about that. We help people make landscape plans. We talk about other habitat, important issues like water and shelter. And then as you upload your counts, you will be asked, did you create a pollinator space as part of this project? And in 2019, we actually had over 2000 people say yes but I could only verify over 900 new spaces. So I put a plus there. And in 2020, there were 575. So I'm very excited that because of y'all and um, other master gardener groups and people who love gardening and insects, we have over 1500 new pocket gardens in the state of Georgia. Now, wouldn't it be something if these pocket gardens may be connected and we had a corridor of sustainable pollinator habitat I mean, that to me is thrilling and it's very exciting, especially when you think about things like some of the bumblebees that are considered endangered, maybe not quite on the endangered species list, but considered in trouble. If they have everything they need, they have food, water, shelter, a place to nest, they won't leave an area bigger than maybe 300 to 500 square feet. That means that your garden can actually make a huge difference in real life bee conservation. And that's powerful. I mean, that is powerful and that puts um, the power in our hands to make a real difference here. 
So one of the things we talk about, and Alan was mentioning it early, we like to stick a lot uh, to native plants like this coneflower. We like that because they do are more sustainable and they, they partner well with our insects. So this was just one of the gardens that was new in 2020. I think it's beautiful. We teach people that when you're gardening for pollinators, it's a little bit different than just a, uh, your average garden that you may have learned about if you were like a landscape architect. Landscape architects are taught to plant in groups of threes and fives. Um, that's supposed to be more aesthetically pleasing. Well, what we found is that insects, especially when they're migrating, they need a bigger stand of flowers. So instead of thinking three to fives, think of fives to sevens or sevens to nines, like big old patches of coneflower or milkweed or mountain mint, and then have flowers of different sizes and shapes and colors to get a big diversity of these, these beautiful insects. <coughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me, y'all. My the allergies are just getting me something fierce. We also teach um, um, about different types of bee balm, things like that. One of the projects that we're working on at GEMREC are native ours of, of bee balm. How do they affect our pollinator populations? So all of these flowers are beautiful and they attract insects, it is a win all the way around. And I of course had to throw this one in. I um, happened upon this in this beautiful little carpenter bees has run around the inside of that flower underneath those anthers and had that pollen rub right off the back of her thorax there. So she is definitely carrying pollen from one passion flower to the next and it's just to me, it is, um, I never lose that sense of awe when you see how these insects and these flowers have evolved together, how the flower will make something beautiful to attract that pollinator, especially when we think about how pollination really is accidental. This carpenter bee did not visit this passion flower to say, I'm gonna help this flower out. I'm gonna spread pollen around so that flower will make seeds and will continue on. That flower has something the bee needs, whether it's pollen or nectar. And in order to get that bee to visit and spread the pollen around, they've evolved some amazing structures. And I know y'all have seen it. Y'all are gardeners. You've been out there sitting down in the garden, checking things out. So you see the same things I see. It's really amazing. This is mountain mint. It is currently my favorite pollinator flower, although it changes. And I'm going to show you why this one is my favorite right now. For years, I have encouraged gardeners to plant mountain mint in their garden. Why, they asked me. Flowers aren't very showy. No real color here. Well, I'm about to show you why. Because on this one mountain mint plant right now, there are literally hundreds of insects. All kinds of bees, bumblebees and honeybees, a lot of our small cute native bees and carpenter bees. There's some beautiful wasps out here today, along with some of our very tiny, tiny bees. So if you aren't growing mountain mint in your garden, you are really missing out on an mm -hmm. opportunity to enjoy the spectacle of all of these beautiful insects. So it's fun for me to share plants that I find um, my favorites. And I've been pushing mountain mint, as I mentioned, for years and years. And a couple years ago, it actually made it to, I think it was the um, Native Plant Association had it as their one of their plants of the year. And it, it will be one of the plants of the year for the 2022 Pollinator Plants of the Year program. So I'm really excited about that. And I know you guys see really cool plants and I love it when you share with me some of the cool things that you're seeing as well. So let's go to some numbers here. We're talking about is the pollinator census successful? What are we seeing? What are we doing with the results? So here's the raw numbers and all of these numbers are about to become published in the Journal of Entomological Society of America. If you've done any scientific research 
you know that the scientific process is laborious and very time consuming. So although the first statewide count happened in 2019, we're just now to the point where it's gone through peer review. I've had all of the data double checked, triple checked, all the statistics have been triple checked and we're about to go to publication, I think in July of this year. So I will make sure everybody knows about that. But here's what people were seeing. So 2019, we had over 131,000 insect visits categorized. And if you look at the numbers, I am really excited about that small B number. So if you remember from doing the census, a small B is categorized as anything that is let smaller, any bee smaller than a honey bee. So that's pretty easy to learn and get your eye used to that size. But for me, an entomologist, most of our non-bumblebee native bees are small bees. So to me, we're looking at a big chunk of our native bee population and to see so many was really exciting. So that number is very heartening for me. Um, of course, we, we teach people how to tell the difference between flies and bees and, and how wasps are very important predators in our garden. They actually will come in and take away some of those caterpillars for their, their nests. So if you're growing things like cabbage or cucumbers and you don't like cabbage worms or pickle worms, planting flowers among your vegetables will bring in some of those wasps and they will hunt out those caterpillars for you. So again, it's more of the educational component. And then of course the butterflies, the gateway insect. Who doesn't love a butterfly? And it's they're really easy to teach people some of the major ones that we see in that time of the year, and then they get hooked. So, you know, the goal here, you go out, you sit down in your garden for 15 minutes with your sweet tea and your pencil, and you come away amazed. Now, 2020, we saw considerably less. And the, you, I was tempted, of course, to blame the pandemic on that. We had less people, people are panicked and they're not outside counting insects, but that is not the whole story. And I'll tell you the whole story in just a second. So here are some additional numbers. We had almost 5,000 counters in 2019 and almost four, so that's a thousand difference. And considering the situation, that's not too bad. I am hoping for 2021 that we break 8,000. I would love to see 8,000 people counting in 2021. And I'm of course recruiting in some of the counties that are not represented or underrepresented here as well, because we want a good cross section of the state. We want to know what's going on in all parts of the state. So here's some data that I pulled from an elementary school I was working with last week, Colum Ferry Elementary, and they're near Athens. And we were looking at the data. Some of their um, older students, their uh, fifth graders, were doing actually some, some data manipulation. And we were talking about how 2020, we had so many less number of insects spotted. Why would that be? Then we pulled the weather data. So the average temperature really didn't, wasn't that different, just five degrees. But if you remember back in elementary school math, the mode is the temperature reported most often. So when you upload your counts and you report the temperature, this is the one that was reported most often. So 84 in 2019 and 69 in 2020. We're also talking about the weather description of sunny versus cloudy. Now at 84 degrees and sunny, everybody's flying. All those flowers have, are open, all those bees are flying, the butterflies are doing their thing, everybody's warm and happy. At 69 and cloudy, some bees aren't flying, some butterflies aren't, and what this doesn't even tell is if you remember that Friday, it rained. So Friday in August, an all-day rain event is very rare. We may get a pop-up thunderstorm in the afternoon, but not a soaking rain all day. So really that took out a lot of our counters. So I tend to blame the um, pandemic a little bit less and the weather a little bit more. So I'm hoping in August 20th and 21st in 2021, it is sunny and 84. 
So how is this data used? Well, it's already being used in crop valuation studies. And what that means is Georgia is, has um, a lot of our crops need pollinators. We grow a lot of watermelon here, a lot of peppers, a lot of apples, all these things need pollinators. So they've actually figured a way to put a dollar figure on pollination services. And so they're using our data on how many pollinators are around in the valuation of how valuable they are in our economic uh, cropping system, our ag system. So that's a little bit above my statistical pay grade, but I know they're very excited to get that data and that's what they're using it for. We're also hoping over time, of course, we mentioned to determine trends in our populations. Um, also, during the census time, we may find somebody that sees a rare bee. Maybe they see a rusty patch bumblebee. And, you know, during census time, we have a, a whole bunch of entomologists on call to look at pictures sent by phone or by email to, to give a determination if somebody really wants to know species-wise what's going on there. This year, we are asking people already to look for the sculptured resin bee which is a bee that is an invasive bee that is, takes over the nests of our carpenter bees. And we wanna know how far into Georgia it is. So if you are someone who is on iNaturalist, you can look up the sculptured resin bee project that I've started. And if you see one, you can upload it there. So we're using um, all of our citizen scientists to determine a whole lot about what's going on with our pollinator populations. And of course, we wanna to continue to add more sustainable, useful pollinator habitat. And these are some of our really great partners. I love, or really, really do love and enjoy going all over the state and meeting with some of these groups and working with them. And these groups have events. They're great groups to partner with. They um, will promote the project. They'll have events on census days, or maybe they have a pollinator ID class ahead of census days. So I really enjoy working with all of them. And those of you who've known me for a while, you know that I am a very big, see if I can get this to work. I'm a big Georgia fan. So my friend, Jennifer Levy there, she is head of the Urban Bee Lab at Georgia Tech and she and I work bees together. And we decided we were gonna have some fun with this. And so we created this little video <laughs> and it was run at UGA on their campus. It's also run at Georgia Tech's big billboards, but it's a way to show that we can all get along for pollinator health. <laughs> so we have fun, the partners have fun. The whole project to me is a lot of fun and very useful. So that was the video we ran the first year and it's updated now. All right, so now we have a quiz time. So I'm going to show you a picture. It is, it, we're gonna pretend it's August 20th. The sun is shining, it is warm. You are in your garden by your favorite plant and you've got some sweet tea and a pencil. So we're going to, if you see this little insect on your favorite pollinator plant, which category will you put it in? And Karen, um, you can put your answer in the chat box and Karen, if you can kind of monitor that, we'll see what people are, are noticing. So this insect arrives on counting day and you need to put it in one of the categories. Which one will you choose? Karen, do we have any takers? We have one that said honeybee. Small right. bee. Small bee, okay, yeah. Um, and it's, it is hard to, to have a reference on a picture, but this is actually a honey bee. So small bee is a good guess. Uh, we know it's a honey bee by the striped pattern here on its abdomen, the, the hair around its face, and we can see that it's carrying pollen in a pollen sack. So there's a small bee, uh, a honey bee for you. What about this one? This lands on your favorite plant. What do you think this one is?
All right, for those of you who guessed um, carpenter bee, you are correct. Because this bee is a large bee, but you'll notice the abdomen is hairless. We say that that bee has a shiny hiney compared to a bumblebee, which has a fuzzy rear. So that is an easy way to tell the difference between a carpenter bee and a bumblebee. And in August, carpenter bees and bumblebees will be everywhere. All right, I gave a hint with the last one. Which category will this bee go into? Bumblebee. Mm -hmm. Definitely a bumblebee. You can see the fuzz all over that rear end here. You can see that the tarsal claw here. This bee is helping this tithonia by getting some pollen, moving it around. All right, what about this creature? Uh, yeah, this is a wasp and um, wasps get such a bad reputation. And honestly, I grow plants to attract wasps specifically and I don't grab them. But the only time I have been stung by a wasp is when I've been in my own home barefoot and I've stepped on a dead one, honestly. Mm -hmm. And that is a true statement. So they're such good predators, and that's one of the reasons we included them in the census. They do move pollen around, but they do not have pollen gathering apparatus. But wasp, that would be an easy, an easy one to put in that category. All right, we're getting a little more difficult. We definitely know this doesn't look anything like a bee or a wasp or a fly. Mm -hmm. So we would definitely stick this one into the other insect category. This is actually um, a, they call them trash bugs. It is the larval stage of a lacewing. And you may remember lacewings are those beautiful creatures that lay an egg on a pedestal. And the reason they do that is to protect that egg from predators and to protect the larva as the egg hatches from each other because they are ferocious predators. Their favorite food, aphids. So their larval form is really clear, but as they travel around, they will put plant debris on their bodies. So it looks like it's just a garbage bug. And the only way you really can see them is when they move. And they all look very different depending on what plant they're on. It will depend on what plant debris they put on themselves. So they're very interesting insects, and I saw a lot of them in this last August. All right, so I hope it's on your calendar, August 20th and 21st. Um, there's the website. We have a really active Facebook group of almost 3,000 people. We're, we've started learning more about bumblebees this week. I'm posting a lot of really fun information about them. We have an Instagram, and I'm honestly not great on Instagram. Uh, I'm trying to get better. But this year we have a new podcast, the Great Georgia Pollinator Podcast, which I'm having a lot of fun with. We're learning about research that's going on. Uh, we, I had a photographer on to teach about taking good pictures of insects. So hopefully you will join us on some of those um, media, some of that media or all of it. And with that, I'm going to stop share and ask for questions. All right, any questions? I know I went, went through all those numbers pretty quickly. Just type it in the chat, in the chat box. All right, everybody's typing in the chat box. I see the guesses. Emily did a great job. She got the other. <laughs> Well, my question to you all is, are y'all excited about August 20th, 2021? Are y'all gonna be out there counting insects? If you decide to have, oh, that she did a little excitement there. If y'all decide to have an event that you need me to help promote, you just send me the information and I will put it on the, in all of our social media and I will put it on the events section of the website. So just keep that in mind. If you're planning anything, I'd love to help you guys promote it.
So no questions. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let that set for just a second. And I'm going to pull up that one little video that I think you guys would really like. I put it in there on purpose. And let me pull, try this again. While you're loading that, uh, is my am I coming through? Yes. Yes. Well, let me quickly okay. tell this story. When Becky Let's came to, oh, I'll tell it after she gets through with this. In the spring, you may see areas like this, where bare soil is piled up around a single hole. Don't be alarmed. There are bees at work. What you are seeing are the burrow openings of solitary bees. Typically called mining bees, these fascinating insects overwinter in ground burrows and emerge from March to May in Georgia. These little bees are often hairy and some look like they have a mustache. They're non-aggressive and would rather fly away from you than sting. These are important pollinators of early blooming berries and fruit trees. The females pollinate while gathering pollen and nectar for their underground nest. After mating, eggs will be laid in the burrow chambers for new bees to emerge the next spring. The burrows provide a safe home for the bees to grow into adulthood. So instead of reaching for an insecticide, just enjoy the show. Contact your local University of Georgia Extension office. If Aren't those the cutest things? They are about, uh, it was more than a month ago, I was working the Master Gardener help desk and there's a lady who called in and wanted to know, wanted, told, told me she had these little bees all around her yard, in her front yard. And could I tell her what they were? And honestly, I'd never seen any bees like that, or that I realized that I have, I've never seen that. And uh, so I looked it up and we talked it over and she decided that she wasn't gonna do anything with them that, since they were good pollinators. And so I had to really applaud her. And applaud you for helping her make that decision. Good for you. Uh, yeah. I was going. I was going to tell the story that Beck, uh, Becky, when you visited us in person about two years ago, you brought a um, a bug motel hotel. Yes. Uh, so it was on a stick, and it looked like a birdhouse, mm -hmm. but it was scientifically built, a design for for uh, bees and wasps, etc. To, to go in these pre-drilled holes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you brought one of those and we gave it as a door prize. The gentleman that won it was a member of our local um, community garden in downtown Newman. Well, he being uh, quite ingenious, he started duplicating what you had given us. And from that point, which for the next 18 months, he brought one each month and it was given away as a door prize. Aww. And it was a, and his quality of work, his paintings on it, they were very, uh, very desirable uh, by the people, you know, each month that yeah. won, won their little B motel. So anyway, I wanted to let you know that the one you gave us multiplied into many. Excellent. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that story. That is great. Yes, I have um, several uh, out and about, and I've seen, um, I haven't seen any bees emerge yet. It's been really chilly up here, but those are great. Thank you so much for sharing that. I do have a question and a comment. Okay. Uh, from Dale Cinco, uh, she said, uh, she, has the census indicated any reduction in the number of pollinators in Georgia? Uh, well, first of all, hi, Dale. Good to see your name. I uh, hope everything is going well with you. Um, we have not collected enough data yet. Since we've only had two years of statewide data, we need at least five plus to show any trends. So we will definitely be looking for that. 
But that is a very good question. So thanks for asking. And Emily Wilbert said, I really like the presentation. Very useful. Thanks, Becky. Thank, and thanks, Kawita and GEV. Oh, well, thank you, Emily, for that sweet comment. Yeah, as you guys know, y'all know me by now. This is my passion project. But I will tell you that we're doing some things um, with on fireflies. So I have a new publication that just came out. Um, you can Google fireflies and the publications part of it. And I'm doing some presentations on that coming up this summer. Having moved to the mountains, I was infuriated by my neighbors who left their lights on all night long. And then being an entomologist, I did a lot of research and found that y'all know that Georgia's the number one state for varied species of fireflies. I mean, I had no idea. So I spent all summer last summer heading out to the woods, look, grabbing my husband in the middle of the night. We're out looking for fireflies. So be looking for more information on fireflies things. Do we not have any more questions? No more questions. Okay. We well, thank y'all for having me. I so appreciate seeing y'all. Um, I enjoy familiar faces and I wish y'all good luck with your gardens and everything this summer. And I look forward to seeing your counts in August. Thank you very much, uh, Becky, for a wonderful program. We look forward to having you back in person uh, in Coweta County. Uh, and remember this month, we're one month closer to being to that point. And we'll keep working on our, on our health conditions and uh, stay safe. But one of these days, we'll all be back together and we look forward to having you with us at that, at that time. Look forward to each one of you being back with us next month when Melanie Furr presents this uh, in, uh, fascinating story of Sibley, uh, a little, uh, hummingbird that uh, wound up spending uh, a year with, uh, with Melanie. Uh, and of course, we all know how fascinating and beautiful hummingbirds are and know that we'll have a lot to learn from Melanie. So hope to see each one of you back next month. And in the meantime, stay safe, but have a good time.